make videos, there's a good chance you want them to look super cinematic so that many people enjoy watching them and you can be proud of your art. But you've probably found out that it's not as easy as buying a camera and using AI editing apps to get there. I had this exact problem when I started out, so I ended up doing trial and error for a long time until I was satisfied with my videos. With this guide I want to save you some of that time. You will learn the most important aspects of making your videos more cinematic, even if you use cheaper cameras or your phone. But what does cinematic even mean? When you search the internet, you find many different definitions for the word cinematic and it can feel slightly unclear. But if you search for it here on YouTube, you're likely striving to make your videos look and feel professional instead of amateur. So videos that look professional is the definition that I'm going for here. There are certain aspects that differentiate professional videos from amateur ones. In this guide, I will go through them one by one and teach you how you can implement them into your videos. You will also find them marked as chapters in the timeline and description. Let's start with the most important aspect, which is shooting intentionally. Beginners will usually film randomly without really thinking about what each shot needs to accomplish for their video or how to make each one look really good. Professionals know how to make both planned and unplanned shots look great during the shoot. Of course, there's also the storytelling side of intentional shooting, but in this video, I only want to focus on the visuals. So if you want to learn more about storytelling, I will leave a link to another video that I did before in the description below. So what does intentional shooting mean for you and your videos? At first you need to stop letting your camera film constantly while walking around. It's better to get single shots and be very clear about what each one shows. When shooting a travel video for example, I could keep my camera rolling all the time while going to a temple. That's not cinematic though. Instead, I can get a few single shots of me going there and what surrounds me and at the end I can capture a wide shot of the temple or me entering it. But being intentional about each shot is only the first step. The second one is how you capture every single one and that involves many steps within it. One aspect is your lens choice, which goes along with framing and composition. For example, I can get a wide shot to show what's going on around the subject or I can get close or even fully zoom in to blur the background and only focus on something specific. This depends on how important the background is for the shot to tell the story and how you want it to look. When thinking about this, it's also important to be aware of the focal length of your lens and the aperture you're shooting at. If you shoot at a wide focal length such as 24mm with a high aperture like f8, everything is in focus or at least visible. Sometimes it can be good to show the big picture of what's going on. On the other hand, shooting at lower apertures such as f1.8 or f2.8 gives your shot more depth by blurring the background, which is often perceived as more cinematic, but it doesn't always make sense to do that. You can also use a much longer focal length such as 70mm or more to bring the background even more out of focus and put more emphasis on the subject. Zooming into a longer focal length also lets the the background appear to be closer to the subject, which allows for interesting compositions. All of those focal lengths and apertures are okay to use as long as you use them with intention and that basically means the story that you want to tell with your shot and the look that you're going for. So you basically just have to ask yourself before you get every shot if the background is important at all, if not then it's perfectly fine to blur it out or if the background is more important to tell the story. In that case you want to blur it less or you don't want to blur it at all. And then you should also ask yourself the question if there's a subject in the background that you want to emphasize by bringing it closer to your main subject by using a longer focal length. Of course, especially if you do run and gun shooting, you won't always get it right, but try to nail it as much as possible because then you get better over time. Next you want to think about your framing and composition. If you place your subject randomly in the shot, it often looks amateurish and poorly planned. And by the way, you can't do that in post and you shouldn't do it in camera. A better way is to try to capture unique angles and also turn on the grid lines in your camera and use these lines to frame your subject. To make it easier, put your subject either in the center or on the lines to the left and right to stick to the rule of thirds. Most of the time you also want the subject to point towards the larger part of the frame as otherwise it feels weird like staring at a wall. But even that can be fine if you use it for storytelling purposes such as showing that a person feels stuck. However, that's just the tip of the iceberg. You can also play around a bit with the grid lines and put different points of your shot on the intersections of the lines to come up with interesting compositions. To get better at these things, I also recommend you to get into photography because there you always focus on capturing one still frame at a time. So it's more about framing, composition and kind of telling a story sometimes only in one frame, which is a lot more complicated. It's actually why I recently got the Fuji X100V here. Like this is also something that I can still improve 
and this camera doesn't even have a zoom lens, it's more photography oriented. So on days where I don't work on my YouTube videos or I shoot other videos, I can just go out with a camera, have some fun and focus completely only on framing and composition by getting really nice looking photos. And I actually like that it doesn't even have a zoom lens because it forces me to move my body instead of zooming in and out all the time. So I can definitely recommend to get some small cheaper camera, especially just for photography to improve that. But there's more that you should be focusing on while shooting. Another good point is camera movement. Camera movement can make shots more interesting and make transitions easy while still shots, which Craig Adams and Jake Fru for example use a lot, have their own style and allow to focus more on framing and composition. Both moving and steady shots are an artistic choice for that reason. They make your videos feel different and you can also mix them up depending on how you want each shot to feel. Just play around with both to see what you like more and when. Of course, steady shots are easier to get because for smooth motion your camera or phone should ideally have decent stabilization, otherwise you need a gimbal or you can use certain techniques to move your camera smoother. For example, you can pull your camera away from your body while using a camera strap, which helps a lot. You can also move your body only while holding your arms still and close to your body to avoid shaking. But shaky camera motion can also be an intentional choice, for example to make a hike or sports feel rough. Just ask yourself if the camera motion really needs to be smooth. If the shake is fine, then you can turn stabilization off if necessary. If you don't have the budget to afford a camera or a phone with great inbuilt stabilization or even a gimbal, then I would recommend to get a cheap tripod, like something for $20 or so on Amazon, and use that to capture still shots while completely focusing on framing and composition, because videos like that are actually quite nice to watch, and you can also reframe the videos in post and add animations, so that it looks a bit more interesting in case the steady shots are a bit too boring for you. In that case, I would recommend though to at least have a 4k camera or even more because that allows you to crop in more and add these animations to your shots. And if your camera already has decent inbuilt stabilization but you're also thinking of getting a gimbal I would just recommend to get a like super small gimbal such as the Crane M3 or M2S because you will likely not need your gimbal that much and then it's not that much weight that you carry around in your bag. That is at least how I handle it. Problem of course that you oftentimes don't get the full range of motion with these gimbals but it's actually not that much of an issue usually for just some walking shots or so, it's perfectly fine. However, there's one more important aspect of shooting cinematic videos and that is lighting. If you don't use light properly, you can color grade your videos as much as you want and they will never look good. So how do you light your videos properly even without professional studio lights? First you need to understand that lighting is about creating depth in your shots. You want your subject to pop from the background and you want to bring out details in your shots by using shadows properly. In order to do that, you have many options depending on how many light sources you have. When shooting outside, you usually only have one light source, the sun. Sometimes you can also use some reflections from brighter walls or other objects. Because sunlight is the most pleasing during golden hour, it makes sense to get most of your shots either within one hour after sunrise or one hour before sunset. It's actually quite hard to not get good shots during those times, unless you're surrounded by clouds like we are at this time of the year. Can't change it. As there is only one light source outside, if you don't bring any artificial lights, you can only focus on positioning yourself and your subject. If the sun shines directly in the face of your character or on the front of an object, there's not much depth. That's why it's usually better to film from an angle where the sun is either somewhere behind your subject or shines on it from the side. Having the sun behind generates a nice rim light effect around your subject, which separates it from the background. Light coming from the side throws shadows over the face or subject and therefore reveals details and depth. My general rule of thumb is to shoot from the shadow side of your subject because that always creates a bit more depth. But of course you can't always do that. Sometimes you want to have something different in the background or so. In that case it's perfectly fine. Not every single shot in your video must be perfect. So just do it as much as possible and always remember this rule from now on. Shoot from the shadow side and you will mostly do it right. If you have to shoot during the day, the same rules apply, but it's a bit more difficult as the sun is high up in the sky. Filming in shadowy areas helps then, because that lets the light come from one or more directions, what gives you more control. If you're shooting inside, it's also pretty much the same, but you have more options, because you can control your light sources better. On top of that, if you use studio lights, you can use more than one. But if you don't have any budget for that, you can also shoot your videos close to your windows. Windows are a great light source, as they are big and soft. 
While doing so, make sure to use the same lighting rules as if you would film outside. Place the camera on yourself so that the shadow falls over your face and if possible, place another light source anywhere behind you to get that rim light effect. And little pro tip here when you're shooting at home, I used it both for my desk setup here, but also for the sofa setup that you've seen in the beginning. And I, the tip is that you want to use your ceiling light so you can use it to create a hair light effect. So you essentially have like kind of a rim light on your hair that separates you a bit more from the background. And as you can see, I use only these two lights there on my ceiling while I unscrewed the light bulbs of the other two because I don't want the lights to affect my face. Like if I would point my key light to my face but then also I get light from the ceiling that would change the temperature of the light so that's not good anymore. I only want that in the background or over my over my head directly to create the hair light effect and I do that by only using these two there because when I sit on the sofa they're directly on top of me so it only really falls on my head. When I sit here on my table then they are behind me so it also gives me a bit of a hair light but it also makes the wall a bit bluer or colder so that the background color temperature separates more from my skin. Just a little tip here like you can sometimes make it super easy you don't always need the most professional setups to create certain effects with your lighting. You can also use a reflector or fill light to make the shadow side of your face a bit brighter in case it looks too dark. Reflectors are cheap but if you don't want to buy one you can also use a plain white pill or a piece of paper. If you use window lighting, the main downside is that the light changes all the time, so I suggest you to only shoot for short amounts of time in one position and then move to another window so that the viewer doesn't notice these changes. For this reason it makes sense to eventually invest in professional lights. I just got this new light here from iFootage which is the Anglerfish SL160D. I can absolutely recommend that for video creators because you can get this super nice small stand here and the light itself is also really small and that makes it super handy for creators that want to move their light around quickly. But of course, depending on what's available in your area, you also have many other options from Ambitful, Godox, Nanlight and Aperture and so on. So just check out what's available in your area. But when you choose a light, what's most important is that you get one with a softbox and a grid inside the softbox because that grid prevents the light from spilling around in your room so you have full control of the direction of your light. That's important because otherwise you oftentimes are not able to really get the light that you want and the softbox inside is important to get soft light because if it looks too harsh on your face that's not really beautiful. So in short use backlighting to generate separation through the rim light effect and side lighting to throw shadows over your face or your subject. Both create depth and therefore a cinematic look. There are a lot more details about lighting but if you just stick to these basics your videos will already look really well made. You've likely noticed that I didn't talk about camera settings yet and the reason for that is simply that if you apply all the tips and techniques that I told you until here without changing anything in your camera, your videos will already look a lot better, a lot more cinematic. And that's something that I want to tell you here as well. A cinematic look is strongly defined by what happens around your camera and not just what's going on inside. But of course, by setting your camera up properly, you can make your shots look even better. The first thing you want to change for a more cinematic look is your picture profile. Which one to choose depends on your camera but you want to make sure that it captures a high amount of dynamic range. If your camera supports 10-bit recording, you can turn that on and shoot in so-called lock color profile, which is super flat and therefore gives you a lot of dynamic range. However, 10-bit is usually not available in entry-level cameras. Therefore, I recommend to use a flat but not lock picture profile. In most cameras, these profiles have Cine in the name to help you a bit. If you're not sure which one to choose, search on YouTube for your camera name plus best picture profiles and watch a few videos about it. On your phone, you usually have the option to install third-party apps that give you better recording options. On iPhones, for example, Filmic Pro is a great app that also offers a lock picture profile in 10-bit for certain phones. If you use a GoPro, set it to the flat picture profile. Next, you will want to lower your sharpness. I always set my sharpness to the lowest setting possible in every camera because sharpness only means digital sharpening which doesn't look cinematic and can be done in post. Don't worry, reducing the sharpness setting does not mean that your image is less detailed. The detail comes from your lens and the sensor resolution. So by reducing the sharpness, you just make it look less digital, but all the detail is still there. Sometimes I even use a diffusion filter in front of my lens to make the video look even softer and get a nice highlight glow effect. This tool is also used by many filmmakers to make their footage look less digital. The filter that I use is the 1 over 8 mist filter from Nisi. 
To get an even more cinematic look, I also suggest to set your frame rate to 24 frames per second as that's what cinema movies are filmed in. However, some people don't like 24 frames per second as it doesn't look as smooth as 30 frames per second. If you prefer 30 frames per second, that's absolutely fine, it will just have a different feeling as movies. If you want to use slow motion in certain shots, you have to use a higher frame rate though. If you edit your video in 24 frames per second, shooting in 60 frames per second will give you a 40% slow motion effect and 120 frames per second will give you 20% slow motion. There are different ways to achieve slow motion and it depends on your camera, so it's best to watch some tutorials about slow motion to understand how it works. Just search for it on YouTube and you will find plenty. When it comes to camera settings, it's also important to get your exposure right. That saves you a bit of time in color grading and it also prevents you from noisy shadows in case you're underexposed or blown out highlights if you're overexposed. You can't always prevent that completely, especially with cheaper cameras that don't have that much dynamic range, but generally the better you expose your shots, the better it will look later and save you time. The most important tip is to set your camera to manual exposure. This gives you full control and ensures that the exposure doesn't suddenly change during a shot, which could look quite amateurish. Now it gets a bit tricky. Ideally, you want your shutter speed to be set at an amount two times your frame rate or whatever comes closest. For 20 for 4p that's 1 over 48 so 1 50th of a second and for 60p that's 120 or 125 depending on your camera. The reason for this is that it gives you natural looking motion blur. Then you want to set your aperture to the desired look. So if you want a blurry background set it to the lowest and if not it will usually be somewhere between 4 and 8 as most lenses perform best in that range. You also want to keep the ISO as low as possible to avoid noise but if you shoot in a lock color profile on your camera you want to shoot at the base ISOs which are a bit higher. Just just google your camera name plus base ISO to find out which number it is. Some cameras also don't let you film lower than your base ISO, so that's actually good if your camera does do that, because then you know what your base ISO is. If you shoot in low light, you will likely have to raise your ISO a bit, just keep it as low as possible to avoid noise. But if you don't shoot in low light, you will likely get problems with these settings, because your video will be way too bright, especially if you shoot with a low aperture to get a blurry background. This is why people use ND filters. ND filters make your image darker and therefore allow you to to keep both the shutter speed and aperture low. Unfortunately, ND filters are not cheap. If you don't have the budget for one, you will either have to sacrifice background blur by raising your aperture or sacrifice motion blur by raising the shutter speed. In both cases, your videos might look less cinematic, but to be honest, I also raised my shutter speed a lot in the beginning and most people watching your videos don't notice it unless you tell them. So raising your shutter speed in the beginning to expose your shots properly is okay, but it's better to invest in an ND filter as soon as you have the money. Another question is how you correctly set your exposure and as you can see the image right now looks a bit different as the others because right now I'm not shooting in a lock color profile, right now I'm shooting in a color profile called Classic Chromium on my Fujifilm straight in the camera because I want to show you a bit about exposure. So right now I've exposed for my face so my face should look good, it looks at least good on the screen here, might change later on the computer, maybe you have to do some slight tweaks but it should be fine. But now the thing is that you see that the sky behind me is blown out and that's despite having a a cloudy sky here so it's actually quite flat by nature but you can't see any detail there anymore and this is because I had to overexpose so that my face is not too dark. So let's say now I want to show you more detail in the sky behind me then I would have to underexpose so let's do that quickly now I look at my histogram and now you can see now you see the detail in the sky all the clothes are there but my face is way too dark, doesn't look good anymore. It's also true for the opposite. So let's say we have the shadows here, like the dark parts of the trees. Let's make that bright to reveal a lot of detail in there. Now we have a good amount of detail here in the trees, but the sky is completely blown out and also my skin doesn't look good anymore. And that is what you need to be aware of. Like what is the important part of your image? If the important part is the sky, then you should underexpose and then you can get, for example, a silhouette shot where your whole body is dark or whatever subject you film. Or if you need to expose for the midtones, like skin especially, then you have to ensure that that looks good on your screen. And of course, if you want to show what's going on in the shadow side of your image, then you have to expose for that. So there's always a trade-off. And that's why I always use cameras that have lock profiles with 10-bit color because that allows me to capture a much higher dynamic range. Let's do that quickly. So now I'm recording an F-Log 2, which gives me more than 14 stops of dynamic range, which is a lot. And you can see that now all the detail is there in the sky. My face looks good on the screen and there is also a decent amount of detail in the shadows. That is actually the reason why people pay so much money for cameras, because that gives you this high dynamic range. Now, cheaper cameras 
cameras also oftentimes have lock color profiles, but they are only 8-bit. And if you record lock in 8-bit and you color grade it, oftentimes is that the image falls apart, doesn't look good anymore, you get color artifacting, etc. So it's not actually usable most of the time on those cameras. Aside from exposure, you also want to ensure that your white balance is correct. This saves you a lot of time in the color grade. To make it very easy, you can use the sunny and cloudy presets in your camera when filming outside. But when filming inside or to get the most accurate colors outside, it's best to set your white balance manually using a gray card. Just choose the custom setting in your camera, hold the gray card where the square is, press OK and it will capture the correct white balance. If it fails, your gray card is likely too low or too high exposed. Make sure that the gray card is well exposed in this case. Gray cards are very cheap, so there's really no reason not to get one. These tips will definitely help you shoot better videos quickly, but of course it requires a good amount of experience to actually become a good videographer. Practice makes perfect after all. That's why I've created my practical videography course, where I give you real life drills that you can do to become a good videographer quickly. These drills require you to go out and do certain tasks so you can directly gain practical experience instead of just learning the theory. This greatly speeds up your learning process. The course is part of my Learn with Pascal online school, where you will find 7 courses with over 44 hours of tutorial about all aspects of videography. Purchasing my courses is also the best way to support my free video tutorials on this channel. You will find a link to the practical videography course and my online school in the description below. That was a lot of information about shooting your videos, I know, but on the plus side, the more you do right in your camera, the less time you have to spend fixing things during the edit, and this is why you should always try to nail as much in camera as possible. But this is what we're coming to now, video editing. There are a lot of things you can do during the edit, but for now let's focus on the most important things to make your videos cinematic, which are basic editing, sound design and color grading. The video editing app you use doesn't matter much, but I recommend using something more professional such as DaVinci Resolve or Final Cut Pro on your desktop and LumaFusion on iPads. DaVinci Resolve is free and very capable, so definitely worth a try. After you make a rough cut of your video to create a storyline, put your shots in order and cut out unimportant information, you want to start adding music into your timeline and cut your video to it. To get music with proper licensing to use on your YouTube and other social media platforms, I recommend using Epidemic Sound. They have one of the best music catalogs on the internet and at only $9 per month it's incredibly affordable. With the link in my description you get an additional 30 days for free so you can try it without any risk. This video is not sponsored by Epidemic Sound but I do get a small commission when you subscribe to their service through my link so that's another good way to support my channel. Something important when choosing your music is remembering that the music defines the mood of your video and not the other way around. You should ask yourself how you want your video to feel like and choose your music based on that. Epidemic Sound makes this easy for you as you can simply choose the mood you need and find loads of tracks. They also suggest similar tracks to the one you're already listening to, which makes it even easier to find what you're looking for. After you've found the right track, add it into your timeline and cut the music to the beat. During the spoken parts, you should make your music quieter using keyframes so that the viewer can hear and understand you well. You can also remove the music completely while you're talking if you like it. It sometimes helps to use music without vocals to make it easier to listen to you and it's perfectly fine to use more than one track in your video. In some of my videos, I actually use up to 10 different tracks to really adjust the music to each part of the video, so there's no need to limit yourself here. After the music is done, Done, you want to add sound effects to immerse your viewer more into your video. Both DaVinci Resolve and Final Cut Pro include free sound libraries with lots of good sound effects, but that's usually not enough what makes your Epidemic Sound subscription even more useful because it includes 90,000 sound effects. Again, link in the description below, it's actually that good. There is a lot more you can do during the edit, such as special effects and fancy transitions, but it's very easy to overdo these things, which actually makes your video less cinematic. So if you're starting out, just focus on the basics first. Do good sound design and when you've mastered all of that, you can learn to add fancy transitions and special effects to spice up your videos. One more thing that you should learn though is how to hide jump cuts. You can do so by zooming into the next shot, overlaying jump cuts with b-roll footage and starting the audio of the next clip before the current clip ends, what is called a J-cut. These are easy ways to actually make your videos better to watch, but there's one thing we're still missing of course color grading. And it's going to stay missing, at least for now. Okay, I want to be honest to you, there's so much that I could say about color grading that I can't fit it on into this video anymore, which is why I would suggest you to check out these two videos here in the corner where I teach you how to color grade cinematic fast. But my main piece of advice would be to focus more on good lighting because that's always more important than color grading and it can't be done in post.